I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined by Nick Eftemides, an American government, government official, author, and educator, best known for his work, Chinese Intelligence Operations, published in 1994. Nick's 34-year government career includes employment in the CIA as a technical operations officer, special agent in the U.S. Department of State, Bureau of Diplomatic Security, and a senior intelligence officer in the Defense Intelligence Agency. Nick was also a senior research fellow at King's College War Studies Department in London, and he has an MS in Strategic Intelligence, National Defense College, and a BA in East Asian Studies from George Washington University. He currently works as an assistant teaching professor in the Penn State Homeland Security Program. Well, Nick, welcome. So let me start out by saying, um, you're the author of Chinese Intelligence Operations, published in 1994, and you've just recently published a paper on this uh, entitled On the Question of Chinese Espionage in the Brown Journal of World Affairs. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and what makes this a focus area for you? Well, th this I went to part of my undergraduate graduate work in Taiwan um, and have lived and traveled in China and Japan as well. Uh, so I've had um, a background on China, having my degree in East Asian studies uh, since the 80s. And I started actually uh, working on Chinese intelligence in the early 90s and have been working ever since in that area, either professionally or academically. So I, I've had quite a long history of looking at Chinese espionage, in particular, uh, the commercial components of it. Ah, okay. Well, so for, for the audience who may not know, this would be myself included, um, is there is there kind of a simplistic way to explain our current relationship with China? Would you call them a friend, foe, or, or are they something in between? Well, I, I think the, the term is frenemies. So uh, there, there's no question we have a good trade relationship with them or um, components of it are very good. People-to-people uh, -people exchanges are very good. Uh, China's risen, uh, you know, 400 million people out of poverty and is starting to take a, um, a role in the international world and the international environment. The problem is, is that um, China's objectives, and, and part of this kind of leads back to Confucian culture, which is still very pervasive in China, and it doesn't really recognize equality. It recognizes you being below them or you being above them. And, and this stems from every aspect of, of, um, of personal interpersonal relationships all the way up to nation state relationships. And so China is striving greatly, and I'll quote Xi Jinping at this point, uh, to take its rightful place at the top of the world. China sees itself as having been superior and having suffered a century of humiliation at the hands of the West. And now that they have money, which was largely gained through the U.S. trade relationship, uh, they intend on putting themselves, changing the international order that we have come to know post-World War II to something that's more suitable to Chinese governance model, which is unfortunately a brutal authoritarian state. So there are areas that we're most definitely at odds with them. Ah, okay. Well, uh, now, Nick, if it's possible, could I ask you to move your microphone a little bit closer? You're, you're a little bit faint. Sure. Sorry, uh, I'll have to move closer because I'm not on a mic. Oh, no, no worries. No worries. Um, well, so are, are the Chinese, and I know this is probably a dumb question, but I'll, I'll edit all of this later, by the way. <laughs> um, are the Chinese still communists then? And in this day and age, would you say that they're more or less of a potential threat than Russia is? Well, certainly they're not communists. And as a, uh, as a senior Chinese official once told me when I asked him almost the same question, and he said, Nick, whatever we are, we're going to do whatever works, and we're going to call it you know, socialism with Chinese characteristics, period. So, um, so th that's the way their leadership sees it. And it's about maintaining party um, power. That's first and foremost, uh, you know, the uh, objectives of the, uh, of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, and uh, then doing right by its people and trying to raise its people out of poverty. 
So those are the two objectives that that that, that uh, governance model lives by. But I wouldn't call it um, communist by any means at this point. Uh, are they more of a threat than Russia? Yes, unquestionably. Um, and I think that actually sort of bothers Russia in a way. But uh, but Russia is in every way, shape, militarily, economically, um, politically taken a, a second a backseat influence wise. Global influence has taken a backseat to China. Ah, OK. I, well, China is definitely large in trade. The, China is our second or third largest trading partner with billions in trade every year, including many of our most complex consumer technology components. Now, we, we've had a saber rattling relationship with them uh, over issues like the South China Sea. But I guess in a, from a larger perspective, because of this massive amount of trade going on, can either country really honestly risk damaging that trade relationship? Well, not um, not in a fatal swoop. Uh, I mean, not immediately. Uh, what the could, U.S. could do is they could um, um, they could disengage somewhat. Uh, start moving their investments out of China, and I think specifically in the production realm. Uh, and, and this is already happening, by the way. It's already happening because labor rates have gone up so much in China, and um, the threat of, of trade issues with uh, between you know China and the U.S., and lastly, because of the forced um, theft of U.S. intellectual property and trade secrets, those three components are pushing companies away from China and towards more fertile areas for production. So I, I think this is happening. Uh, the question is how much their behavior um, accelerates the pace of this going on. But you can see Korean companies moving out of China, U.S. companies moving out of China, Japanese companies moving out of China, all investing as the four tigers, if you will, in Southeast Asia. Mm, okay. Okay. And now Taiwan would be different, right? That we would, yes. when you say moving out of China, they would still be highly invested in Taiwan and its technology infrastructure. Yeah, very much so. Ah, okay. Um, now you've written that the difference between the United States and many other nations who conduct intelligent acti intelligence activities is that our goal is to determine and counter hostile military capabilities, not to develop our own industries or transfer foreign wealth. Right, right. that's correct. Um, and, and one of the big, one of the key differences you see between Chinese intelligence and uh, and the U.S. and and this can be expected. I mean, any nation will conduct intelligence activities based on its own needs, right? We, we don't do intelligence for intelligence' sake. We do it to support a political and military apparatus and an economic security apparatus. Um, however, in the case of China, its needs are economic development. Its needs are technology. Uh, and this, this, we see this from government documents, you know, leadership strategies all the way on down. And they, in fact, bring forth uh, what I call a whole of society approach towards collecting uh, information to support their specific needs. And their needs are economic, primarily. So the United States looks at this from a political military standpoint. And we have a lot of laws in place and a lot in our society which prohibit a very close contact between industry and uh, and governance and and not just in intelligence and a number of other and just about every other where a way it's a laissez-faire government model uh but china does not in china they're wholly integrated mm. yeah now you one of the other things you've written was that in 2014 15 and 17 the national people's congress and the state council publicized the requirements that all chinese citizens and companies operating in china must collaborate in gathering intelligence. So companies and citizens are required to provide the government with intelligence upon request. And I guess they face severe punishments if they don't comply with that. Right. And and although they don't list things like prison sentences or stuff, they say, um, you know, the, the citizens must comply. And uh, in fact, even this last year that um, uh, China insisted that every company over 50 people have a party representative, a CCP representative, representative within that company. And that includes foreign companies as well. So the, the party is, um, is totally integrated into society, into the business infrastructure. And it's going to use that as much as possible, whether it be through individuals or company contacts or, um, or their technology access. 
to um, to you know bring for the benefit of the party and the com- and the country. And as the national security law in 2017 states, as well as implementing relations, you know, implement, implementing regulations that followed um, later on that year, um, they're very serious about the necessity of complying to those rules. Yeah, and this goes to something else that you'd written about. There was an unspoken social contract, right? Where, yeah, so so there's economic gain as long as it doesn't usurp or undermine the um, the, the political risks. The- yeah, so long as and and that is the unspoken social contract in China that um, you know we will provide and you will have great economic gains. And remember, this has been a society that for three thousand years has been one step above starvation most of the time, um, particularly the case in the 70 years of the Chinese Communist Party. So all of a sudden, the uh, the contract appears, look, half a billion of you basically have come out of poverty under our leadership. Don't rock the boat. Don't, you know, question the politics. And we will bring you economic wealth, economic growth and wealth. And by and large, you find most Chinese um, are not really political. It's, uh, you know, again, it's sort of this... Uh, Confucian structure, you know, they used to have an old saying that the uh, the emperor is far and the mountains are high. So, you know, Beijing's very displaced out of people's lives and they like keeping it that way. So they, they worry far more about economic issues than they do political freedoms. Hmm. Now, now, and this, I guess this would go more to the business side of things, but you, you'd you also written, or I may have found this through research, there's something like 150,000 state-owned entities in China, and right. 50,000 of those are owned by the central government. And this is across the board, right, from aerospace and defense to research to technology transfer organizations. So it, it sounds like, from what you're saying, Chinese citizens are compelled to help them like with with information, potentially even espionage, if they're required to, right? Oh yeah, well, and, and bear in mind that is the that is just the state-owned apparatus, right? Fifty thousand um, organizations centrally, and about a hundred thousand provincially. Uh, so yeah, th- those are not state employees, but the, the state owns more than half of each one of those each one of those organizations. And moreover, there's a cultural dynamic here. I don't even think from China's perspective, it was probably even necessary to publish those laws because you don't make it in the Chinese system unless you're collaborating with the government. You don't become a large company. You don't, you know, move your product out unless you're working with the local customs, you're working with the local provincial government. You have to be, and and what we would call bribery and corruption, that sort of standard business model in China. So, and I say that, that's a Western, you know, that's our you know, our, our definition of corruption. It's not theirs. That's just normal. So um, we would have, so you have a lot of that. You don't make it up the ladder. You don't make a large company without paying off um, officials at provincial and national levels. So not unexpected at all that the response and your requirement is therefore going to be to contribute to the nation. And that's the phrase they actually use. Ah, okay. Now, so so in terms of actual cases, you've it, it, this is one of the things I believe. Some of this is is a uh, well. You've done an analysis of 464 actual documented cases of Chinese espionage worldwide over the last 30 years. And you'd mentioned that most of those actually happened since the year 2000. So I guess one thing I'm wondering is how that might compare to other countries. And and I guess the the, the unspoken question or would be, how many more cases do you think are out there that we're not aware of because nobody well, got caught? That's- That's the, you know, as as far as compared to other countries, uh, China dwarfs them by tenfold of any country you could think of. So that's, that's, you know, indisputable. I mean, and you can take a look at FBI statistics on prosecutions and such, and they're all in the 80, 85 percent are, you know, are against Chinese, uh, Chinese entities. And that a factor of the recent FBI effort in the China initiative that goes back decades. Um, mm. Just because of the uh, the aggressiveness of that type of economic espionage, so um, so that's one component. Um, I'm sorry. The second part of your question. 
Well, yeah. So I, I wondered how compared to other countries, but then the other part was, I mean, just just guesstimates of, uh, you know, I mean, is that is that the tip of the iceberg? Then I guess I, I look at it this way, um, uh, and and I'll I'll just talk into the theft of research at this point. So there are about three hundred sixty three thousand Chinese scholars and students in the United States. Now, by a long shot, I don't believe. You know, a large percentage of them are involved with theft of research, okay, which uh, happens to be, you know, apparently in the news prevalent. However, just given the numbers, I mean, the FBI say, it says they have a thousand active cases, okay, a thousand active cases, 365, uh, 360,000. That is basically 25% of 1% of the, the whole number. So, Two percent of any population is bad. Two or three percent of of politicians or police or something. You, you always have some bad level, you know, some people who are going to break rules within a population base. So just given the numbers, if you're looking at three hundred sixty three thousand and say, OK, two or three percent are bad. That's ten thousand or more cases, 10, 12,000 cases. And the FBI only has a thousand. So I and, and I actually think the number is a bit higher. Um, and, and again, this goes back to Chinese culture because we are a very legalistic society. The United States is a very, very legalistic society. You know, you have in a contract that's considered the law, not so in China. In fact, they really, they really look at it very confused, you know, in a confused state when they see the United States. It's not that way in China. They will always, people will always talk about how China is a personal relationship. It's a Guangxi relationship as it's called. Um, and they don't look at signing a document that says, I will, I will not disclose this information as anything that's particularly binding to them. Mm. So I, I, I think the, um, I don't think we're at 10% of the type of actual theft that's going on. You know, and it's interesting. You just mentioned, I think you said 363,000 students and stuff. And, and so I guess one of the other aspects of this is, um, well, I, I guess I'd come to this in a minute, but, um, how, how you would how you would address this without like without racism or cultural you know culturalism or anything along those lines i guess right i mean that's that's always the issue with with this is there are some cultural aspects but then at the same time we don't want to paint with a broad brush i, I don't know do you right. have well, any thoughts actually, on that? Yeah, it's pretty interesting you bring that up because I, I said that once at a conference and they said nick it's not the only culture that doesn't believe in documents. You have tons of other cultures out there that feel the same way. So, it, and it was an interesting point. It's really Americans are sort of the outlier in that. I mean, Western Europe, you have a lot of tradition-based agreements, right? Not so much in the United States. Um, so we're really the outliers. Um, as far as the world, you start getting into the world of policy of how we should all contend with this. Um, and, and I agree, if we have a broad brushstroke, it's not relevant to the Chinese. It's relevant to everybody. You know, it's got to be clear that all students and scholars that come to the United States um, and I have suggested inside, uh, you know, as uh, advising the government, I've suggested let's put something additional in the visa applications so that they understand parts of American society. They understand the seriousness of, of, the, of the law here and that um, that Americans follow a rigid legal structure and you really can't break that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just things so that people are, are educated before they come to the United States. And if they're tempted to think about something, there'll be some percentage that says, well, wait a minute, the U.S. is pretty serious about this technology stuff. So I'm not going to I'm not going to you know, do anything. But part of it is going to be an education process. And the other part of it is going to be a government outreach to industry, which we are don't think the government's doing a great job in, uh, but government outreach to industry to and to academia and teaching them how to protect themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you'd mentioned that the, the annual cost to the world economy from this, from the intellectual property theft alone, is estimated to be something like $600 billion. Um, and then the annual losses to the U.S., from from China's IP theft are estimated at around three hundred and sixty billion. So this is right. big dollar sums coming from yeah, absolutely. Well, and th that doesn't include the secondary and tertiary effects. So, and I'll give you an example: just the theft of production methods and such for solar panels um, put U.S. businesses, U.S. industry out of business. 
Um, China turned around and flooded the market, you know, with cheap solar panels and U.S. because they stole U.S. production techniques and uh, technology. U.S. couldn't compete. So we have a loss immediately. But then you have how many families that are out of work, how many mortgages that can't be paid, how many people are on Section 8 housing. And the same thing happened within the steel industry and uh, solar wind as well. So there are a lot of industries that you not only lose uh, the initial investment, the research, the market share, huge part of it is the market share, but then all the follow on effects of, of, of dresses that aren't being bought and cars that aren't being you know purchased. And, and those other elements are, are a big hit on the economy. Hmm. Now, is there a legal framework in place where like Western countries, not just America, but, but countries outside of China can sue for protection or, or you know, to, to be made whole again, I guess? Well, there is um, in 2016, uh, the Congress passed the Defend Commercial Trade Act. Uh, and we have seen, in fact, I've taken a look at that for cases. Um, we have seen a lot of cases come out, lawsuits, uh, and it was the first time that it was put in civilian hands to be able to sue foreign companies for trade theft. So we are seeing a rise in cases in, in um, that type of remedy. But globally, there's nothing I've advocated for this uh, foreign policy wise that really needs to be put in place agreements between Five I nations and NATO and, and our allies, basically, that say, look, if you violate the rules here, that bans you from not only the United States, but from doing business in Japan or Europe or any place else. So and, and you know, when you look at China's belief in, in how it needs to rise, to be the top of the world, that's fine. But it needs to to live in a system of rules, you know, that that we can globally work together on. And that's the problem. There, there, there is not that system in their head. Their system is we win, you lose. And, 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 you know, if you're on board with us, we'll give you, we'll share with you, but that's the way it's got to be. Mm. So it's very much an, imperial, it's an imperial model that they've had for thousands of years. Well, yeah. Now, another thing you've written about was the trade craft, right? And that's the, the specific clandestine collection techniques. And, I guess this may tie in with something else you talked about called Chinese espionage is is like the whole of society, I guess, right? Whereas in the West, it's it's more of a specific niche of trained people. But I, this sound, I feel dumb even asking this, but does that mean that China has a network of spies, handlers, and other intelligence collection here in the United States right now? Well, yeah, by the thousands upon thousands, if not tens of thousands. So it's um, and it's again, it's it's that whole of society approach that says, well, the state owned enterprise has access to these individuals and these companies have access to those individuals. And then there's just basically the way you could describe it as a whole freelance network. Like um, perhaps the woman who went to Mar-a-Lago looking for information, you know, looking to collect information. So it, it's this this net of thousands, tens of thousands of people that um, only get the, the the most basic guidance or direction from central levels. And we need A, B, C, D, E, F, G technologies. And the state-owned enterprises and the government, the companies are willing to pay for it. So it, it's actually ironic. It inspires this capitalistic espionage model where people and companies and, and scholars go running around trying to get information to make money back within the Chinese system. Hmm. So that's that's different than I think the way most people I mean, like on TV, right, where you have your stereotypical Russian spy and it's it's one person who's highly trained, kind of working alone and, you know, delivering envelopes under a door at midnight or something. It, it sounds like this is kind of more decentralized, almost like a friend of a friend mafia style thing. That's ex exactly what it is. And, and herein you hit on the on the central problem is that the U.S. government is not structured or capable of dealing with this type of model. They're far more structured and comfortable and have been for, you know, since the Cold War. Um, they are far more capable in that model that has um, that has a spy, you know, sneaking around in the night servicing dead drops. So now that it becomes the legal structure isn't in place to contend with this. Uh, nor is, are the numbers of persons that you would need to do it, nor is the knowledge and the awareness of tradecraft and then security processes for industry that you would have to put in place to meet this societal challenge. 
Yeah, and the industry part is the part that I'm most interested in because I think that the government is is well aware of this, right? I'm not sure what steps have been taken, but I think industry is definitely the biggest gap. And, you know, there are new companies, uh, new companies being formed, new companies doing business in, in the Asia Pacific region all the time. And so even if some companies are able to protect themselves, others might be new to it and not have any idea, you know, what the playing field is. But one thing I wanted to ask about was, um, and this for me personally, when I worked in the tech industry in Seattle, uh, there were lots of people here on H-1B visas. And I did some research. It shows that in 2018, there were 47,000 uh, Chinese nationals here working on H-1B visas. And that's usually technology workers, if I understand it right. Yes. Um, right. So has the U.S. government looked at limiting those H-1Bs at all to, to help prevent some of the, the IP theft? Um, I, I actually can't give you an answer for that, even if I knew it. Um, I, I don't know what the government has done visa-wise in looking at that. My, my knee-jerk reaction is to say no. I don't think that they've been limiting that at all. But, um, but I, I don't have any information one way or the other. Uh, yeah, I was I was just curious because again you'd mentioned, you know, I mean the the corporate theft. Well, mm -hmm. now one of the other things that that you talked about in the paper was um, for national security planners, there's an issue of losing the military technology advantage, and that a lot of right. Chinese advances in weapon systems are based on stolen technology. Right. Yeah. I mean, that that's clear. In fact, some of these, there have been some publications out tracing that, not only on the commercial side, but then the Chinese aircraft, J-20 and such, which uh, look exactly like U.S. counterparts, uh, as well as many espionage cases that I've uncovered. In fact, out of the now well over 500 cases that I have, probably somewhere around half of those are military or related dual use technologies. Uh, and about 25% or half of those, or 25% of the whole, are aerospace technologies, aerospace. So, you know, you see a clear correlation in their targeting F-35, um, F-22 proprietor, that's C-17 tankers. You know, you, you have seen a clear movement, uh, Mark 48 and Cap torpedoes, of them collecting this information or repeatedly trying to collect um, this information. And, of course, their military has grown um, not only uh, um, in numbers, you know, in the naval forces and air forces, but in capabilities as well. So there's somewhat of a myth of Chinese innovation in this area. I mean, they show their greatest innovation in theft of U.S. technology. Well, do do ITAR regulations help prevent some of this from occurring? ITAR regulations let you prosecute. That's what they do. And most, and as you just pointed out, most of the cases oh, that okay. I reference are, are, are ITAR. So what they do is they allow you to say, hey, you're not allowed to send this out. You did. You're under arrest. Um, EAR is more typically, that's uh, export administration regulations, and those are more typically um, fines, but can result in more serious charges too. Um, so it, it doesn't, again, that's a after the barn has already left. Uh, sometimes, in fact, a lot of times, um, uh, we will have cover companies set up, and Homeland Security does a good job of this. Uh, you know, working cover and, and getting a person before they're able to get stuff and send it out. So there's a mix there, uh, but they, they do try and do aggressive enforcement. But it's, you know, the proverbial kid putting his finger in a dike. It's just leaks are all over the place. Well, now for, for I guess for corporations that are affected by this, do you have any thoughts or advice on how they can prevent, you know, preventative measures that, that might basically stop yeah, I, I, I actually do a lot of work with corporations um, you know consulting to them on what they can do and uh, and you know I get a lot of requests from the government but I actually sort of turn down most of them and very specifically for the reasons that you say you know it doesn't help if you guys die with your secrets you know if you circle the wagons and throw blankets over your secrets and lie on top of it and say we're secure that doesn't help if the rest of the country's dying because they're they're vulnerable. So I do look towards supporting industry, towards helping industry. Um, and I, you know, it's a combination of things. It's a combination of training, of training employees, of training insider threat staff, of creating and training insider threat staff, training security, um, 
the executives, the C-suite executives, really need to understand exactly what the threat is. And that's one of the things I'm actually happy about is because I sit on so much data, uh, I'm able to articulate a case usually very convincingly, uh, even to professors. And if you can have professors not push back on you, that's a, a clear sign that um, that your you know your data is good, your analysis is good. Uh, but it's so it's it's a full training and education program you have to do in industry, and that's one component. And then there are a whole lot of things the insider threat staff has to do on issues of usage, monitoring, document tagging, all those types of things. And that's where cost comes in, right? So they have to gauge all those things and, uh, and form a risk management process so they understand what level of risk they have for different components, right? The things that are very, very critical to the survival of their business, they may have to invest. You know, that, that's where you invest. It's not worth losing a half a billion dollar product that it took you a hundred million to invent, which is, you know, we have seen. Um, if you, you know, you invest the, invest the $50,000 to protect it. Okay. It's not a big investment at the end of the day. So th there is, there's a whole lot that needs to be done in insider threat training and, um, uh, being aware of the threat and training staff and employees. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that because I, I suspect you may get a few calls for consulting work after this. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, now Pew opinion polls show a decline over the last few years, over the last decade, a decline in favorable opinions of China. Uh, it went yeah. from in the, the 50s down to 38 percent. Does this mean I mean, I know this issue has been in the news. Um, do you think that this might be what's driving kind of a wedge in the relations? No, actually, that Pew, those Pew opinion polls, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they're global. I think they're U.S., if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, it, it gets a mixed reaction when you talk globally. China's Belt and Road Initiative has had pluses and minuses as well in opinions. Uh, it, it's never usually as advertised. So, uh, um, so I, I think that... But what it shows is that the PRC propaganda machine is not as effective externally. Um, but that's okay. You know, they, they, they understand that and they're going to work on it again and again and again until they get better at it. So it's, um, it does help in that people come to a realization. It helps when attention is brought to some of the acts, whether it's treatment of minorities such as the Uyghurs or theft of intellectual property that happens regularly. Uh, it helps when these things come to light and are publicized because people get a better understanding of the nature of China and in particular China under the CCP. So it's an important component is the media on this. And I think it's reflected in the Pew Opinion polls. People just are waking up. I mean, I, I complained about this 30 years ago, but people are waking up to problems systemic in the relationship and China's beliefs in how it should rise and hmm. not playing with the rest of the world, but changing the rest of the world. I see what you mean. Well, I mean, given, I guess, given these issues and then the ongoing nature of our trade relations with China, um, it, would it be fair to say that the benefits of international trade outweigh the risks and the drawbacks that we're looking at in the future? Um, no, it's it's never, you know, not without adjustment. I mean, and this is going to be 10 years of adjusting this relationship. It's going to be a good 10 years, easy. Uh, and it's it's just got to be a more coordinated effort with our allies and people who believe in free trade and free society. Uh, you know, they're, they're asking China to change their habits and their behavior and their what we define as a corrupt system to more adhere to international norms. That's not going to be easy. Okay, It's going to take a very long time to do an effect. Uh, but there are a lot of issues that, that have to be addressed. If not, you know, the rest of the world really became, becomes vulnerable. 